Hey guys, Pastor Ryan Hurt here at LBC. I'm so excited that you've tuned in to listen to this message. But before we begin, I would ask that if you've been blessed by LBC or these sermons, that you might consider giving back to us so that we can continue to put out these resources to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, both here in Lingaville and the world abroad. You can give on this app or website. As happy as that we are that you have tuned in, we do ask that this does not take the place of being a part of the local church, and we encourage all folks to be a part of the local body. We are gl glad to provide this sermon for you, and I pray that this message helps you and you're growing in Jesus Christ. Bless us. Lord, I'm so excited about what the Lord has for us this morning, what he's had for me this morning. I say this all the time. If I'm preaching about it, I'm struggling with it, and so I'm preaching to myself. So if this is for nobody else, um, it's been good for me. Um, if you don't know this about me, I, I stay in my camper over here on, on Saturday nights because I like to get here about 4 or 4.30 in the morning and pray over all the chairs. And Melissa gave me the do better talk about seven years ago that I better not ever wake her up at 4 o'clock in the morning again. Um, and so it's just become this natural thing that I do. I just come to the camper on Saturday nights and uh, spend time just seeking the Lord. I'm begging the Lord uh, for this to be more than just a Sunday morning service. I think one of the fears that I have is that we just get in this routine of Sunday morning Christianity. And so every Saturday night over there, if you would walk by my camper, um, you'd think I'm an old Pentecostal preacher. Man, I'm just begging the Lord to do what only he can do. I know that, that all of our stories are different. I know that so many of y'all are bringing so much junk and garbage in here. Um, and I wanna see change broken. I want us to see the freedom that Christ died for us to walk in. And I hope that, that we are always and forever doing everything short of sin that, that we would leave here today not going, well, I had a good day at church and it made me feel good, but that we leave here one degree clo closer than we were when we got here, right? That we are a work in progress, but that we're always moving forward and that we would see this freedom that Christ died for us to walk in. And so as I prayed over these chairs this morning, I just felt like that's gonna be someone's story today. Um, and if it's for nobody, it's for me because I found some freedom this morning and a lot of things um, that the enemy's just had his grip on me, um, just his, his tactics even exposed in my life. And so, man, my prayer that through this, this talk today is that we can just get to a place of, of, again, underneath Sunday morning Christianity and a place of, of truly operating in the freedom that Christ died for us to walk in. And so, with that being said, we have been on this journey over the last couple of weeks looking at um, the second part of our mission statement that says that we are who Christ says that we are. We just saw it in the video. Um, and we, we took from that James chapter 1 and 18, 18 verses into the book of James, which by the way, we are going to come back to the book of James. We had to take a little detour, um, but because what I've learned in the past few weeks, and again, my own story is that, that for a lot of us, you know, James was talking to his church in Jerusalem and he, he stops in the middle of the sanctification process and goes, but you are his prized possession. And what I've learned is that even in my own walk is that, that more days than not, I fail to see myself as God's prized possession. I see him, I see myself as a pastor, I see myself as a husband, or I see myself as a dad, and sometimes I don't even see myself in a, in a good realm of even those things. But, but I fail so often to just see that, that on my worst of days, I'm still God's prized possession. That, that I'm enough for a holy king on all days of my life. Even when I'm sleeping and I'm snoring and I'm bringing nothing to the table, that God's pleased with me and that he loves me. And what I've learned over these past few weeks is that there's an identity crisis within the bride of Christ. And, and I'm not the only one that feels like we, we fail to see ourselves in this place of, I have a place at the table with the king, with my name on a placement, that on my worst day, God still loves me that I'm not trying to earn something, right? That, that all of that has already been paid for on the cross of Christ. And so I've learned that, that there's just this huge identity crisis within the church. And so we've spent the last several weeks looking at, at tactics that the enemy is using against us because what we've learned is the enemy does not want us operating in any kind of freedom. Um, he, he doesn't want us realizing that I can wake up today and operate in this freedom that Christ died for me to walk in. The enemy knows that that's a dangerous place for his kingdom, and so he's going to do everything that he can to pull us away from that seat at the table, right? He can't take anything away from us, but he can lie to us, and he can manipulate us, and he can whisper crap in our ear that we'll begin to listen, and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll step away from the table that Christ died for us to walk in. 
And we're not operating in the freedom and we're listening to all these lies. And so last week has been just that. We're gonna expose the enemy's schemes, right? What is he doing against us? And we've learned that it's not a pitchfork in him trying to make us bad, but it's things that we, for a lot of us, don't even see happening, right? We look around and go, man, he's been attacking me and I've never even realized um, what he's been doing to me. And so last week we looked at the tactic of distraction and we saw that never more than now are we a people who are just absolutely and positively distracted from the moment that we wake up in the mornings and our alarm goes off, um, we're looking at our phones, we, we feel like we've missed something just being asleep over the, the period of eight hours or however long you're sleeping, we are distracted people, right? And, and we saw last week just that and we're distracted on so many fronts and what was so cool about last week was that was a hard, heavy message and fully expected an email from that. Um, fully expected someone to have some backhanded comment to say about it and knock on wood, it hasn't come yet. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. What, what has come from that is, is people um, in a place of repentance going, look, that was exactly what I needed to hear. Um, one lady in particular is, is heading right now to Las Vegas for the NFR. And she said, it was exactly what I needed to hear. It was such a timely message because I know that when I go up there, everybody is going to know my name. And my name is going to be in the marquee lots. And, and everybody's going to be looking at me. And I have an opportunity to be a lot in that darkness, right? I have an opportunity to make it about Jesus and not about me. And it was just awesome to hear this response of, hey, you don't need to preach that message that offended me. It was, hey, I was able to take that, repent of it, and go to Vegas championing the name of Jesus. And so that's pretty awesome. As a pastor, when people like actually take the word and don't send the email and they go, hey, I'm actually gonna apply it to my life, that's a pretty awesome thing. And, and that seems to be the norm over this past week of people going, look, I didn't even realize how distracted I was until last week. And so it's been a cool response from the people. And so today I wanna look at another tactic, but today I wanna look at some practical things that we can do to wage war against this enemy. Um, because we can't just leave here with a bunch of head knowledge of, well, the enemy's trying to distract me, or the enemy's trying to do this, or the enemy's trying to do that. We're fully aware of that now. And so what I wanna step into today is, what can we do proactively to wage war against this enemy? If we know that he's doing these things, what are some practical things that we can do to make sure that we're operating in this freedom? And so today, I wanna talk about words. All right, now, and not like the word, but I wanna talk about words, words that have been spoken into our lives, words of death and destruction, words that, that have defined us, words that have shaped us, words that have landed like an atomic bomb in our camp, and maybe there's scars in your heart, but nonetheless, they are words that hit you deep. That's what I wanna talk about today. The reality is from the, from the very beginning until we're standing in glory with Jesus, we're gonna have words spoken over us. From that moment, and I, I don't know if y'all did this, but when Melissa was like pregnant with all of our kids, I would talk in her belly. Y'all ever do that? I just put my, my mouth on her belly and I just go, I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait, all the fishing trips that we're gonna have, um, all the things that we're gonna do together the young woman that you're gonna be when you grow up and the young men that you're gonna be when you're growing up. Like I'm just speaking life into Melissa's stomach, right? From that moment to the moment that they were born and I'm in the rocking chair at 3.30 in the morning with them going, do you ever sleep? New moms, right? New dads, you know what I'm talking about? Like how can you be awake for 72 hours and still screaming and you're speaking words into them, right? And sometimes they want the best of words, go to sleep. But there were also those words of, God, you're the best thing that's ever happened in my life. I can remember when Kinley was this big, holding Kinley on my chest, going, I don't deserve you, speaking words into her. From that moment to the childhood bully in elementary, words being spoke over us, to our parents and grandparents, and our teachers and students, and everything else in between, we're constantly having words spoke over our lives. In fact, statistics would show anywhere from 20 to 30,000 words will be spoken over you in a 24 hour period. And a lot of those words are death and destruction. And a lot of those words are ultimately defining us and shaping us to who we are today. And for a lot of us, it's, it's words from our family, right? It's words from our family. Maybe it was a, a father, a mother, a grandparent, aunt or uncle, just someone in our family who spoke death and destruction into our story, and maybe they didn't even mean it. Maybe it just came from a place of, you know, you know who you are. You, you see your family tree. What makes you think you're gonna do that? You're just like your dad. 
You're just like your mom. You're just like your brothers. You've seen where all your brothers go. You've seen what your sisters are doing. What makes you think you're gonna do this thing? They may have not have meant anything bad, but it spoke death into your story, right? You're operating on, oh, you're right. I'll never be able to do that because nobody else in my family has done that. And for a lot of us, we've allowed those words to shape us. For others of us, we've been talking about this over the past several weeks, and this has many faces. We could preach the rest of the year on it. It's the words of social media. A lot of us are allowing the words of social media to shape us and define us and, 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 and tell us this is who we are, right? We're looking at social media and, and we're listening to the words of, man, sh you ain't near as pretty as she is. You, you ain't near the, the mom that she is. Um, her kids were sleeping when they came out the womb and here your kids are four years old and they still not sleeping through the night so you're not near as good a parent as everybody else is. And we start listening to that, don't we? We start buying into that. Their house is so much prettier than yours. Their cars are so much nicer than yours. They make a whole lot more money than you. They do so much better in the rodeo than you. And if we're not careful, we'll allow those words to shape us and define us and mold us to who we are. A lot of y'all are navigating your life around words from nothing else than social media. For others of us, it's wounded people, wounded people. Now I know we a bunch of church people in here and we pretty and got it all put together, but, but the reality is that many of you in this room have, have damaged relationships out there. Ex-wives, ex-husbands, ex-in-laws, you name it. And thank God that he's forgiven us. Thank God that we can come in here holy and redeemed and righteous, blameless, not guilty anymore. But the reality is because we hurt these people and because we wounded those people, they've lashed out in venom, haven't they? You'll never change. You're a sorry, human, selfish person that will never change. You're always gonna hurt the people in your path. You don't deserve God's blessings. You'll never be good enough. You're always gonna be who you've always been. And if we're not careful, we'll allow that venom to define us. You're right, I'll never be that. My ex-wife or my ex-husband is right. I'm crazy and I always will be crazy. And if we're not careful, we'll listen to these lies. For others of us, it's, this is a big one for me. It's the lies, the words of religion, all right? Religion, you're not good enough. You're not qualified enough. You haven't gone to school or seminary long enough. Um, you've got tattoos. You don't look like a Baptist preacher. The newest one in Calvin is my witness can testify to this. You have a beard. Yeah, critique for having a beard. I'm like, okay, I get the tattoos. I get all that other stuff, but a beard, that's biblical. Like, like Eli had oil running down his beard. He was so anointed, but nonetheless, some people like discredited me because I had a beard. But it's religion, right? And if I'm not careful, I'll allow these words to shape me and mold me and define me and cause me to be someone that God's created me not to be from no other place than religion. And then lastly, and certainly not least, it's words from the enemy. And I think this is the biggest one in the family of faith, right? It's the enemy. And we're, this one's a bigger one, but because this is the stuff that we're listening to more times than not. And the enemy's so sly, all he's doing is just taking all these things that's been spoken to us and reminding us of them. Right? Uh, hey, you remember what your ex-wife said? That you're crazy and nobody's ever gonna deal with you because you're just a little bit crazy? Listen, it's true. Nobody ever will. And check this out, neither will God. What makes you think God's gonna love you if nobody else can? You can't even hold a marriage down. What makes you think you're gonna hold a relationship with the Lord down? And we begin to, to listen to those lies, don't we? You have failed at all these things. You're right, your family has never, they've just been this one straight tree that never done anything. What makes you think you're gonna do anything different? And if you're not careful, you'll listen to those lies, right? You'll listen to those words. And even though you come here week in and week out and you hear scripture being read over you, for a lot of us, we've allowed these words to shape us and mold us and make us who we truly are today. And I think what's even more damaging is that a lot of these words hurt us from way back when. They were spoken to our story when we were little kids. You'll never succeed. You'll never be good enough. I know many of y'all um, have, have dealt with a father wound or dealing with father and mother wounds where, where mom and dad just spoke death into your story. And this has become your identity. I'll never be good enough. God will never use me because dad was right, mom was right. In fact, psychology today would say this. This is a secular news source um, 
says this, in psychology today, it says, research has demonstrated that the most negative emotional conditioning and habitual behaviors were set in place. In fact, were programmed very early in life by parents, peers, teachers, social media, and the like. Basic core beliefs, behaviors, and attitudes held by these significant others are often simply accepted as fact and become the truth. Children do not develop the capacity for critical conscious scrutiny until much later in life. Once hardwired within our subconscious mind, these beliefs, behaviors, and attitudes become firmly entrenched and the individual largely operates from the programs instilled to them as er in early life. As adults, these old programs are still running our lives even though they make no sense, limit our expectations, and become detrimental to our well-being. Deep down, we don't even believe most of these lies. Look at this. But somehow they become our identity. Isn't that so true? Even though I know that, that everything that I touch doesn't end in failure, I can entertain that idea and that can become my identity. It is so stinking true because things have been spoken to my story and I believed it a long time and I've programmed my mind to believe that nonsense. And this is the damage of words. There's a children's book that is out there called Ruby Redford. It's written by Lauren Child. And she writes this in, the, in her book about words and how damaging our words can be. Parents of young children, remember these words. Remember this if you don't remember anything else. It says this, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can also hurt me. Stones and sticks break only skin while words are ghosts that haunt me. Slant and curve the word swords fall, it pierces and sticks inside me. Bats and bricks may ache through bones, but words can mortify me. Pain from words has left its scar on mind and ears that's tender. Cuts and bruises have not healed. It's the words that I remember. And man, that's so true. And for many of us, you can testify to words that landed like an atomic bomb in your camp. And yeah, you dress them up, you put your Sunday's best on and you're smiling through gritted teeth, but it has become your identity, sadly. And so we've got to wage war against that. Um, but because we cannot operate as a family of faith where this stuff is our identity, we've got to be able to step into a place and go, but what does God say about me to be true? And so with that being said, a, a few years ago, Melissa got her identity stolen, her like physical identity stolen, like social security number stolen. And she's always had like perfect credit. And we went to go try to get something that like, you got denied and you know, that, that embarrassing, like I've got good credit speak that you got to give everybody behind you in the line when you know, they really don't have good credit. Like we really did. We're like, man, this, how do we not get approved for this? And then we come to find out that, that her identity had been stolen. And if that's ever happened to you, it's a, a chore to get back to where it was supposed to be. Um, we found out some chick was, was buying a bunch of Victoria's Secret on the Eastern Coast. And I mean, just, we had to pay a whole bunch of money to do this. It's still, I mean, we're, this is a couple years ago and we're still trying to get on the other side of that. But in the middle of this, her identity being stolen, they send this piece of paper from the Federal Trade Commission on five things to do when your identity is compromised. All right, well, as a preacher, Anything is subject to a sermon, anything, right? I tell my kids all the time, there's a spiritual application in everything in life. Um, and they get so annoyed by that. I mean, we can be deer hunting and I'll go, all right, boys, what's your spiritual application of this? And they're like, oh, dad, does everything have to have a spiritual application? And it does. There's always something. There's a sermon in everything that you do. And so when I'm reading this, I'm like, there's a sermon in this. And it was so fitting with where we're going today. And so what we're gonna to do today, we're gonna to look at the five things that the Federal, uh, Federal Trade Commission says to do when your identity is compromised as we look at a spiritual application to how we can wage war against the enemy that's trying to do the same thing. All right, so number one, if you're taking notes is this, realize that your identity has been stolen. Whew. Right? I mean, all right, better write that down. Realize that your identity has been stolen. Well, no duh, right? I've lost everything. I get that. My identity has been stolen. So the spiritual application is this. Realize that the enemy is constantly going to try to steal your identity. And he will not relent. He will not give up. He's not going to leave here today going, you know what? They've been in this sermon series and exposing all my schemes. So you know what? I'll go to one of the other 83 churches and get them. That's not how he works. 
He's gonna constantly try to do this. He'll spend a lifetime trying to remind you of all this death and destruction that's been spoken to your story. He will not relent in this. And you think you'll have a good day and he'll just do it again. And he'll find another way to get at your place at the table and pull you away by nothing else than reminding you of all this stuff. And so then we've got to ask, and then what do we do? How do we wage war against this? We wage war against it. Ephesians 6 tells us how to wage war against it. Paul to the church in Ephesus is telling this church in Ephesus, hey, if you want to succeed in this spiritual journey, you need to understand that you've got to fight on your hands. But you're fighting against your ex-wife and you're fighting against your husband and you're fighting against your kids and you're fighting against social media outbursts. Your fight isn't against all that stuff, but it's against the rulers of darkness, the principalities that we cannot see. I'm telling you, if we could just get a glimpse of the spiritual realm around us, we'd be tucked up in this corner like a little schoolgirl, right? There is a spiritual realm that is trying to chew us up and spit us out. And Paul's warning this church in Ephesus of this reality. In Ephesians 6, he talks about how we got to put on the full armor of God. If you've grown up in the church, you know the scripture. It's one of our favorites, right? I'm going to put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to put all this stuff on. And right in the middle of this, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is why I am so adamant that we have got to be about the Word of God. Um, it's not five-point sermons and pretty songs that we like that's going to help you wage war against the enemy. It is the Word of God. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we fight against the enemy and the lies of the enemy by reminding ourselves what the Word says about us to be true. It's that easy. Somebody say, well, it can't be that easy. It is that easy. We've made it too hard. And so if we're going to quit listening to the lies of the enemy and the words of the enemy, we've got to combat that then with, God, what do you say about me to be true? So in that moment when, when the enemy whispers in your ear, hey, you're weak. You're weak. No, Isaiah 40, 31 says in him, I'm strong. You see, it shuts him down. He can't argue that. He can argue a sermon. He can argue a song, but he can't argue the word of God. In him, I'm strong. No, you're a failure then. No, no, no. Romans 8, 37 says I'm more than a conqueror. I'm not. I might beat everyone else, but I'm not to him. Okay, well, then you're rejected. No, Ephesians 1, 6 says that I'm accepted in Christ. Well, you're not important. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6 says that I am his treasured possession. Yeah, well, nobody likes you. You remember what your ex-wife said about you. Yeah, and she's right. I was a real tool then. But Psalm 17 says that I'm the apple of his eye. Ooh, you see, it combats the enemy. What can he come back with then? Yeah, well, you're a victim. I have been a victim. But 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says that I'm victorious. And I'm going to walk in victory, not as a victim. Well, you're all alone. No, no, no. Joshua 1.5 says I'm never alone. Everybody else may give up on me, but he's not. Well, you're ugly. Psalm 45.11 says I'm beautiful in his sight. Psalm 139 says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made that before any of my days came to be, he breathed life into my story. He had all my days mapped out. A plan and a purpose and a reason for me. He thinks I'm beautiful. Well, you're rejected. No. I might be in an earthly standard, but 1 John 3, 1 says that I've been adopted into his family. You'll never be healed. Yeah, you're wrong there, enemy, because Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes, I am healed. I am healed. Well, you're worthless and unworthy. No. John 3, 16 declares me worthy. You see, we could keep going. But, but if we're gonna graduate from this place of Sunday morning Christianity and fight in this realm that is out there that's looking to chew you up and spit you out, we have got to be taking what God says us about to be true and speaking into the death and destruction. We've gotta be. Because if we're not, if we're not speaking the word over this stuff, listen, I don't care how spiritual you feel this morning, there's gonna be a moment where he's gonna convince you that one of these lies is still true in your life. But where we can combat against him with the word, he has nothing on us. Find those scriptures. Put them on your mirror. Do whatever you got to do to remind yourself of the word. Number two, I love this one. Alert the authorities. Prayer, right? That's a spiritual application. Pray. 
Alert the authorities. God, I need you. Listen, if we're gonna get to this place of graduating Sunday morning Christianity, intimacy with the Father and spending time with Him is a must. This is not just a, a good idea. If we're gonna graduate into this place and walking in freedom, listen, we gotta find time for Him. Well, I don't have time for it. Then you need to find time for it. Or you're gonna continue to operate in this realm. Well, I'm too busy. Well, you're gonna continue to operate in this realm. We've got to find time. If we're gonna speak against this crap, we gotta be able to go, God, I'm gonna etch out 45 minutes of my morning where it's just me and you. I'm not gonna get my phone out and put my coffee mug just right and take a picture and put it on Instagram to show everybody that I'm doing a Bible study. I'm gonna lay my phone over there and I'm gonna spend 45 minutes with you, God, just me and you. I want you to tell me what you feel about me. I want this to be mine and your time. I'm not preparing a sermon. This ain't for my kids or my wife. This is just for what you have for me. God, speak to me. Give me a word. And spend time praying and seeking the Lord. And if you don't have that, make time to do it. Do whatever you gotta do. Wake up earlier, wake up at four o'clock. Ain't nothing going on at four o'clock in the morning. Find time to spend time with the Father. In fact, you look at any powerhouse of the Bible and, and through history, I'll show you someone who was constant in prayer. Not just little popcorn prayers over their taco casa real quick so they could hurry up and eat their burrito, but I'm talking people who were constantly in intimacy with the Father. No matter what they were doing, no matter where they were at, we're just gonna stop and praise and pray. You show me any powerhouse in the Bible and I'll show you that was one of their tendencies. Let me take the story of Jesus. In the story of Jesus, in, in Luke's gospel, chapter six, he's dealing with a bunch of religious knuckleheads like he had to constantly do. And he heals this dude on the Sabbath. They get mad. And what does Jesus do? He goes off to the mountain and it says that he prays all night. All night. I got to circling that in my Bible and I was like, I asked the Lord, God, when was the last time that I've prayed all night? I'm not talking like I said a prayer at midnight or I said a prayer at three o'clock in the morning. When was the last time I just got next to the bed and go, God, I'm all yours all night. Whew, that's powerful. And Jesus did this countless times in the scriptures. All day, all night. In Genesis chapter 32 and verse 24, Jacob wrestles an angel all night long until he gets what he wants. He didn't relent, didn't give up. I'm gonna fight this sucker all night long if that's what it takes. The story of David, constantly you'll see this. Psalm 55, 17 talks about how David would seek the Lord in the morning time, in the noon time, and at night time. Multiple scriptures, David will talk about praising and praying to the Lord in the middle of the night, all through the night. You get the story of Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter two, terrible time for the people of God, and Jeremiah lamenting, crying out to the Father, and it says all night long in Lamentations chapter two. Take Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, one of my favorite stories. It's the birthing of the church in Philippi. But not before, it's a lot of bad days for Paul and Silas. And you get this picture of Paul and Silas in a prison cell, all right? Not in a cush, nice, comfortable church, but in a prison cell shackled to one another. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, in the midnight hour, it says, Hey, Silas, I can't sleep. Can you sleep? No, I can't sleep. All right, well then let's just praise. Let's pray to the Lord and sing some songs of praise. Are you kidding me? But, but then you wonder why they were able to make the impact that they were. Because God was that important to them. Intimacy with the Father was that important to them that even in a prison cell shackled up with my buddy, we're going to sing some praises. We're going to spend time praying to the Lord. And so I want to challenge us. When was the last time you've done that? And this is not from guilt and shame. I'll be the first to tell you, I couldn't think of one time in all my spiritual journey where I've prayed all night long, all right? So I'll confess that. But, but I want us to be able to ask ourselves, when was the last time that we've sought the Lord just half as much as some of these powerhouses of the Bible? In that midnight hour when your wife is snoring and keeping you up and you can't go to sleep, instead of grabbing your phone, when was the last time you go, you know what, I'm just gonna go in my closet and I just wanna spend time with the Lord? because it could just be God's waking you up to show you something, to reveal you something. But we cloud our mind with all the stuff on our phones, right? That we would find time to just spend time, intimacy with the Father. God, you know that these things are defining me. And I need to just spend time 
hearing from you and what you say about me to be true. And the last challenge on this one, and we're gonna go to the next one. And again, this is from love. But, but for the married couples that are in here today, I want you to listen to me. How would your relationship with your spouse look if you spent the same time you do with your heavenly father as you do with your spouse? We gotta be honest in that. So if you're the guy that only prays when you think about it once every three, four days over your taco casa, oh, we need to pray over my burrito. What would your marriage look like if you went to her or him in that same manner? I'm just gonna tell you, it wouldn't be much of a marriage, would it? There'd be communication breakdown everywhere. But we gotta be able to ask that. We wonder why we're in such the mess that we're in when I know for myself, I can look back and go, man, when was the last time I just found myself in a posture of just praying for an hour in the middle of the night or in the morning or in the midnight hour when I couldn't sleep? in the bow blind, up in a tree, waiting on a deer to walk in. When was the last time I was just, God, I'm all yours, I'm all yours. I'm telling you there's power in that. This is the confidence that we have, 1 John 5, 14, in approaching God, that if we ask anything, anything's a big word, anything, according to his will, he hears us. Philippians 4, six through seven says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, big word, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Matthew chapter six, verse six, this is from Christ himself. But when you pray, go into your room, right? So this isn't at church. This is when wife is snoring, keeping you up, which by the way, Melissa don't snore. So I'm not making that reference to her. She don't snore, I snore, but she don't. But while your wife is snoring, if she does, go into your room, go into your closet where you can't hear her snoring, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. God, that we would find intimacy with the father, find time for prayer and do whatever you gotta do to make that time. Number three, we take charge and fix any weak areas. Another big one, we take charge and we fix any weak areas. Spiritual application of number three, we need to fix these areas that are messed up in our life. What areas of your life are weak? And the enemy can get his foot in the door. We need to be able to ask that and need to be able to answer that and not give the Christian his answer. Are you leading your family the way that God's designed you to lead your family? You gotta be able to answer that. What doors are you allowing to be wide open for the enemy to come and step into your story? You gotta be able to answer, ask and answer that. What, what is some sin that you're navigating your life around that you know is just at arm's length? What are you doing to keep that sin away from you and not entering into your story? You see, those are weak areas and that's what the enemy's looking for. Are you setting up boundaries in your life? Listen, we need to all have hard boundaries in our life that, that nothing's gonna get in my time with the Father. And so that's a hard line around my time with the Father. I'll tell you, as a pastor, that's a hard line in my circle. I cannot neglect my time with the Father. If that makes someone mad, then it makes someone mad. But I have got to spend intimacy with the Father first and foremost. That's gotta be a hard line that I set up. Because if I step outside of that, I'm in a weak place where the enemy is gonna chew me up and spit me up. And I ask you the same thing. Do you have hard boundaries around your time? Do you have hard boundaries around your marriage? Hard boundary around the things that you're looking at and you're consuming yourself with? What does your circle of friends look like? Are they going out and getting you drunk? Or are they speaking life and truth into your story? You see, these are areas that we've gotta be able to go, look, if I'm gonna graduate from just showing up to church on Sunday, I've gotta be able to go, God, show me. Show me the weak areas of my life. In fact, James 1, 5 will tell us how to do this. You know what it says? Pray for wisdom. In fact, it says this in James chapter one and verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. So just pray that prayer. God, I need to know if there's any weak area in my life. I need to know if there's somewhere, somehow that the enemy might just get his foot in my door. God, I need you to show me wisdom and what my friend circle looks like and how to step away maybe for some friends that are drawing me away from you. 
God, that you would give me wisdom. Let's let that be your prayer and see what happens. God, give me the wisdom to make sure that there's no weak areas in my life. Number four, stay alert. It may happen again. Spiritual application, stay alert. It will happen again. I go back to point number one. He's never going to give up on us. The enemy's not. He's not going to be like, well, can't do nothing to them, so I'm going to go on to the next poor sap. Be on the alert all seasons of life. Keep your guard up. In fact, Peter would go on to say that. Be alert and be of sober mind. So in other words, even on the mountaintops, I know several of y'all are on the mountaintop. Listen, do not under any circumstance let your guard down. I love it that, that we're ministering to a couple. Um, and she made the comment this week. She said, one of the big mistakes that I always make is I let my guard down on the mountaintop. Don't we all? Are we good? We up here on the mountain. We good. I'm just gonna set my tent up and we good, God. And we let our guard down and the enemy runs a blitz on us and knocks our helmet off and we never see him coming because this is how he's gonna work. He's going to absolutely destroy us when we let our guards down. I mean, when you think about the gazelle, when, when the gazelle gets mauled by the lion, when does it happen? It doesn't happen when the gazelle's like, all right, you sucker, where are you at, right? That, that's not when the lion's attacking because he knows that sucker's gonna outrun him. So he's waiting, he's waiting off in the distance. And the moment that gazelle leans down like, okay, I'm safe, we good, now I'm gonna eat me a little grass. Bam, gazelle's gone. And that's exactly how the enemy works with us. And Peter, of all people, understood this. The guy that writes that, look, there's a roaring lion looking for those who he can devour. If anybody knew that, it was Peter. This is a guy who's several years before this is walking alongside the savior of the world. Rock star Jesus, everybody's blown away by everything that Jesus was doing. I would say that's a mountaintop moment. In fact, Peter gets to go to a mountain with James and John and Jesus and Elijah. But he lets his guard down. And hours into Jesus' crucifixion, we know the story. He's denying even knowing Jesus. So if anybody understands the danger of what happens when we let our guards down on that mountaintop moment, it's the Apostle Peter. God, that we be alert. And then lastly, number five. Close accounts that aren't being used. Close accounts that aren't being used. Spiritual application, get rid of anything, anything that's drawing you away from the Lord. I don't care how good it is, how bad it is, how right it is, how wrong it is. We, we love to talk about all the stuff that we should or shouldn't do in the church, right? And I just always go back to, but is it drawing you away from intimacy with the Father? And that's what we've gotta be able to ask. If, if you listen to country music, don't do that, then listen to Morgan Wallen, right? I'm not gonna get up here and go, well, you can only listen to Christian music. But what I am gonna say is if it's drawing you away from intimacy with the Father, we need to be deathly afraid of that. Good, bad, or ugly. I tell my kids this all the time. You listen to what you wanna listen and watch what you wanna watch to a degree. But if it's drawing you away from who Christ says you are, then we've got a big problem. And I tell us the same thing. Whether it's right, or wrong, good or bad, get rid of anything that's drawing you away from intimacy with the Father. We'll see this warning in Philippians 3, Paul to the church in Philippi. Go and look, surround yourself with people like me. That wasn't a, 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 a sentence of arrogance, but he's going, if you want to keep walk this walk, talk the talk and be who Christ says that you are, surround yourself with people who are championing you, who are walking alongside you, go, man, you got this, you can do this. That's the kind of people we need to surround ourselves with. And Paul's going to look out for those who are speaking death into your story. And a lot of us just need to hear that one. All right. And so let's recap as we close. Haley, can, I want to come up here. Number one, we are constantly aware that the enemy is trying to rob us of our identity. Constantly. And he's gonna do everything in his power to do so, but we are waging war against him by what the word says about us to be true. Not what all this stuff says about us to be true. Number two, we are constant in prayer. Listen, he's not our genie in a bottle, all right? He wants us to come to him at all times, but God help us if the only time we're coming to him is when we want stuff. 
He's not our genie in a bottle, but we're constantly having intimacy with the Father, whatever that looks like. It's your table in the morning, in your closet at night, in your tractors out in the fields. We are finding time to spend intimate moments with our Heavenly Father. Number three, we're making sure that there are no weak areas where the enemy may get his foot in the door and doing all that we can to make sure of this. We're putting up boundaries in our lives. We're, we're looking around, making sure that there's nothing that the enemy can't get his foot in that door, whatever that looks like. And we will do whatever that looks like at any expense to make sure that we're operating in that place. Number four, we are constantly aware that the enemy is around every corner. He is not gonna give up on us. He is not gonna relent. He's a roaring lion looking to devour you. It's being aware, we're not scared, we're just aware that there's a lion in the room. There's a lion in the room, where is he? We're like that gazelle, right? I ain't scared of you sucker, but I know you in here and I know you're trying to do something to me. We're aware of him. And then lastly, we're reading anything and everything that is speaking death into our story. Whether it's right or whatever, we're ridding it. God, I only want what I know you to say to, about me to be true, to be spoken to my life. And if anything is severing that, if anything is drawing me away from that, then I'm getting rid of it. I'm just gonna get rid of it. And so if you're here today and, and your story is, look, I've never put my trust and my faith in Jesus Christ. I just wanna say this, man. My relationship with Jesus has been the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. And I know that's cliche for the preacher to say that, but, but, but from a, a life that looked for love in all the wrong places, thank you, Johnny Lee, there's been nothing like having a relationship with Jesus. In that youth room in Grandview, Texas, when I saw my sin ever before me, and I saw a God who would take all of that and forgive me, breathe life into me and call me holy and blameless and righteous and pure and not guilty anymore, I'm telling you, it changed me from the inside out. It changed the whole trajectory of my life. And so if you're here today and you've bought into some religious lie um, that one day you'll be good enough, can I just say this? You're good enough. And that Christ wants to meet you right where you are. If you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, we wanna give you an opportunity to do that. In fact, we're gonna do things a little different this morning. The leaders that are gonna come up here to the front, they don't even know that I'm gonna do this in the second service, but they won't care. But as they come up to the front here in just a moment, we're gonna give this opportunity during worship to just be able to go, look, if this is your story to go, hey, I don't know Jesus. I wanna put my trust and my faith in him. I wanna know about what this preacher's talking about. They wanna have a conversation with you. But if you're like me and you're the introvert, and you're like, I ain't going down front in front of nobody. Then, then we're gonna ask the leaders to stay where you are, even after the end of service. When everybody's eating the rest of the donuts and they're having their conversations, that can be a moment that you can still come talk to one of these leaders and go, hey, I wanna know what the preachers talked about because I've been looking for hope and I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. We wanna give you that opportunity and never wanna put a barrier up for you not to be able to have that conversation with someone. But for everyone else, for the rest of us that would, would check the box of being a, a born again believer, maybe you like me have allowed way too many of these words to shape you and mold you and define you. I'm telling you, man, I am preaching to myself. These came a lot from what I have had to deal with and dealing with. I always hate it because I know that whatever I'm preaching on, I'm gonna have to struggle with in a weird way. And a really cool thing happened last night. Um, I'm in the camper and I'm, I'm just struggling. I'm like, God, I'm talking about identity in Christ and you know that I struggle with this. And more times than not, I don't see myself as a prized possession. And more times than not, I don't see myself as holy and blameless and righteous. And more times than not, I don't see myself just sitting at the table with you, God. And so I asked, I said, God, that you would give me just a supernatural answer. Just speak to me somehow, some way that Gideon prayer that we refer to in the church. I'm gonna lay my, my coat out and if it's wet in the morning, then I know it's from you. It was one of those prayers. God, that you would speak to me. 
and nothing happened last night. I, I went to sleep. I read a text message that somebody spoke life to me. I thought, oh, that's good. But I woke up this morning to a text message from my daughter, Kendall. My 17-year-old daughter, Kendall, at that. And this is what she, what I woke up to at 4.07 this morning. You're gonna do awesome tomorrow. Don't listen to the haters. Do what God is leading you to do. You're the best Jotty in the world. If you don't know us, we have a weird language that we have. She calls me Jotty. I don't know why, she just does. I know we're weird like that. You're the best Jotty in the world. Look at this. First Peter 2, 9. Kendall has no idea that I've been wrestling with this in the camper all night. She said, you are enough, Jotty. I love you so much. From a 17-year-old kid. And I was like, thank you, Lord. And so I read that to say this, and I know that there's people that are here today that are wrestling with the same thing that I wrestled over in that camper last night. Can I just speak the same word over you that Kendall spoke over me this morning? Listen, you're enough. You are enough. Man, quit trying so hard to earn something that's already yours. Breathe. Take a breath. Find yourself back at the table of God. You're enough. Right where you are today, you're enough. And as we close, I just want to read these 10 verses over us from Ephesians 1, because I want this to be God's word and not my word. Ephesians 1, 3 through 10 says this, 3 through 12. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Look at verse 4. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? So before God was in that moment going, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, the moon, the mountains, the stars, he chose you before any of that ever even happened in Christ. And he loved us in that moment before you brought anything to the table. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Did you hear that? That's from the Word of God, without fault. You're not guilty anymore in Christ. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Somebody needs to break those chains. You're not guilty anymore, and that's from the Word of God. So we're just holding God to His Word. Verse five, God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what He wanted to do, it says. And it gave Him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered us his kindness along with all wisdom and understanding. Verse nine, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. Are you kidding me? Can we just bask in that? We have received an inheritance from God for he chose us in advance. He makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, which by the way is us, and now you Gentiles have heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, look at this, he identified you as his own. You're enough. Father God, we love you. God, I thank you for that truth. Not for a sermon that you gave me, but just from the power of your word. And it just reminds me of why we need to be in the word as often as we can. God, to this day, every time I read your promises over my life, it gives me such a comfort and such a peace, especially when all these other things 
have been my identity for far too long, God. And so, Father, I thank you for Ephesians 1 that reminds us that that you love us right where we are today. In fact, you loved us before we ever even came to be. And I pray that, that like you did me this morning, that would just release a burden off of so many of us, God. Because for many of us, we're carrying a weight that was never meant for us to carry. It was carried on the cross. And yet day in and day out, we wake up and we, we're trying to be something and do something and earn something that you just told us in your word that it's already ours. We have an inheritance in you. We're sitting at the table with you. On the worst of days, you love us. So Father, I pray that that would just be the message over this people, that we're enough, that we're enough right here today. Whatever we've brought into this room, we're enough, that you love us. You wanna meet us right where we are. Father, if there's a soul that might be in here today that doesn't know you, I pray that like you did to Saul, Paul on the road to Damascus, that you would remove the scales from their eyes and you would show them your glory this morning. That you would open up the heavens above Lingaville and your spirit would fall down on this place and, and our sin would be ever before us for those that have not put our trust and faith in the finished work of, of the cross of Christ. And I pray that if there's a lost person in this room that they wouldn't leave here where that would be their story and they would find Rick or Amy and have that conversation with them this morning. God, I just want to continue to speak into the identity crisis that's amongst your people. God, that you would open our hearts and open up our minds to what you say about us to be true. Father, for all of us that are carrying all of this garbage from family, father wounds, and mother wounds, who spoke death into our story, from the words of social media that feed a monster within so many of us to the wounded people that we have hurt somewhere along our story. Yes, you have forgiven us, but their words have cut us to the core, to the dangerous, dangerous words of religion that have had its grip on the church for far too long and to an enemy who is constantly on the prowl pray that, that we, one degree of glory, are a little closer than we were when we got here, speaking what you say about us to be true as we leave here today, Father. And this quits being our identity. Because I truly believe, God, that, that where we can walk in that freedom, things are just going to look different. And so, Father, as we worship you, as we're crying out for more of you, Father, I pray that this would be our heart's desire that you would just simply speak truth over our lives and what you say about us to be true. And let this time be yours, Father. We love you. God, we thank you. God, we praise you with everything that's in us. And we ask all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing.